I know you've heard about King Tut and the extraordinary exhibit which is now on display in this country and tonight a very special treat for all of us including us here in the studio to see some slides and some description of that expedition and, and that excavation and that great discovery over 50 years ago. With me is Th Thomas, and I told him I would say Tom Hoving, former director of the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York City, former parks director under John Lindsay in New York City, and now doing what, Mr. Hoving? Well, I'm retired from the Metropolitan Museum of Art after a decade of uh, no work at all, <laughs> no, just getting harried and harassed, and it was marvelous. Uh, I'm writing books, I'm giving lectures, I've started a firm that's going to do consulting and advisory work for museums all over this country and abroad, I hope, and uh, I'm busier now than I was then. Well, speaking of art, now we talk about King Tut. Um, uh, I can't tell the story as well as I heard you tell it uh, recently. Tell us the story of the King Tut discovery, what it means, and, and put us in, in time perspective when it happened and what happened. Let's go very far back in time to the pyramids themselves, the Great okay. Pyramids, which are 5,000 years old, all right? Okay. And I guess uh, one can see them. We have a slide. Let's up. begin our slides. Uh, and uh, There you go. And uh, these were built because inside those were tombs of the great kings of Egypt. But as soon as they were built, they were plundered by tomb robbers. A big problem because there they stuck up in the air 500 feet and they seemed to beckon to the thieves, come and get me. Now we're talking how many years ago? 5,000 years from where we're sitting today, this roughly. 3,000 years before the time of Christ. That's right. Okay, so. So these things were plundered and somebody came up with a new idea. Let's not have something way up in the air that beckons to thieves. Let's stick all of these kings and queens underground. And they chose a place which is in the middle of the desert near Thebes or Luxor, which is the most desolate place you ever heard in your life. And they burrowed right into the bedrock of this valley of the Tomb of the Kings. Very romantic name, very yeah. desolate place. And in the lower left hand, the lower right hand corner, you can see a little black spot. That's a hole of one of these tombs. It's an entrance. And the thieves got to them anyway. Really? The new idea didn't work at all. Secrecy didn't work. Now these thieves are also 5,000 years ago. Well, these are thieves of the time. Uh, old thieves too. Right? And these tombs were jammed with gold. Okay. Now nobody had ever found the tomb of an, a king of Egypt. And everybody by around 1900 of our times thought it was all over. You'd never find one. And there was one man. His name was Howard Carter. He was an Englishman. He was a freelance, self-taught archaeologist. And he believed that the tomb of a king would be found in this valley and that that king would be Tutankhamun, a king who did not have a large history, who was somewhat uh, evasive in time, but he said, it's got to be there. Hmm. The clues came up which pointed to the fact that he's got to be somewhere in that valley and nobody had robbed him or discovered him. So on the 2nd of November, 1922, he dug down to the bedrock in that valley and one day came across what you see here, which is a step carved in the bedrock going right down, a stairway. Now let's appreciate though the, the level of frustration this man had had to this point. He, how many years had he been doing this? Well, he'd been working six full seasons in blinding heat and yeah. found absolutely nothing. And so, everybody was laughing at him right, by this point. Right. You and know, it was important. a kind of a thing to chuckle and say, oh, there goes Howard Carter. You know, he's looking for a king. And Nuts in the desert digging away. There he is. Right. So he finds the step. And they dig down and they find 16 steps leading down to a sealed doorway. And on the doorway, the seals of the official protector of the city of the dead and the name of Tutankhamun. Wow. But he finds in this doorway the obvious evidence of ancient thieves had been in there. So the question was, what had they taken? Had they completely plundered it? But that hole had been replastered by the priests who came back after the thieves had been apprehended, presumably, and kept on going. So, on the evening of the 22nd of November, 26th of November, 1922, he opened up a hole in the second of the two plastered and sealed doors. And at first he didn't see anything, because the ancient air that had been there since the time that the king had been laid to rest 3,200 years ago, kind of went by his candle. Mysterious, mm. incredible moment. And then as his eyes grew accustomed to the dim light, he saw the following. And that was a room jammed to the ceiling with treasures. And this is a picture this taken. This is a contemporary photograph taken exactly that at that moment. time. That's the way they had left it. That's the way years. they had left it. And there's three great funerary couches in the form of animals and extraordinary treasures. 
like this. This is the head of one of the couches where it was a ritual couch with lapis lazuli inlay for the nose and the tear ducts and a marvelous uh, stool made out of ivory and ebony because the king took everything with him, furniture, objects of everyday life, clothing, seeds, farm implements, everything. A gold throne, which was totally overlaid in gold and uh, inlaid with semi-precious stones, was there. Now, there were more than one chamber in this tomb, and Carter found at the end of the room a sealed partition. Would that be where the mummy of the king and the coffins would be? Nobody had ever seen this before really? in known history. So there he is, a photograph showing Howard Carter. He is the one on the right in his shirt sleeves, just having broken through this hole. And there were a group of visitors there watching as if they were at a theater. And there was unbearable silence. And finally, he blurted out when he shined his flashlight, I see a wall of solid gold and blue. And this is what it was. It was the side of an enormous shrine. And they went into that room, and they opened up the doors of the shrine because there were no seals on the outer doors. And they were fearful that the thieves had gotten in there. And when they opened up the second doors, they found this. And that is a 3,200-year-old rope carefully sealing the door with the mud seal off to the left. Wow. And they dismantled the shrines, and they finally got down to a great, great granite sarcophagus. The lid alone weighed two tons, but it had a crack right down the middle. And for another moment, they thought the thieves had gotten in there. But no, somebody had dropped it in ancient times. You can imagine what they said when they dropped the lid of the sarcophagus of the king. And Carter says they lifted that thing up and when the ropes had stopped lifting this thing, they looked and they were puzzled. They didn't know what it was. It was covered with linen shrouds. And they said, carefully, they rolled back those shrouds, their hands quivering with excitement. And when the shrouds were rolled back, they gasped in astonishment because the most extraordinary thing came to light. There were three gold coffins, the entire image of the king, six feet, one inches long. And one of them, this one, was in gold a half an inch thick in some places, 300 sure. pounds just for the lid alone. And they went into that and they found finally in the coffins, the king himself, the mummy. There was a golden mask surrounded by flowers. And this is a photograph showing those ancient flowers. You could still smell them after 3,200 years. Oh, and then after that, they found, uh, this is the gold mask itself, one of the most beautiful things that have ever come out of antiquity. Staggeringly beautiful thing. And then they went down through the mummy, and this photograph shows that the mummy itself, 17 layers of linens, was entirely packed with precious jewels. 143 things they found in the mummy itself. It was a treasure house. This is one. It's a great big chest piece in the form of a vulture, a sacred god. Over a 1,000 pieces of inlaid stone. It's almost two feet across. And then finally, in the third chamber, he found what he said was the most beautiful object I've ever seen in my life a shrine surrounded by four of the protective goddesses of the dead, and this one with their beautiful arms protecting the king and his vital organs which resided inside this shrine because they were removed through his nose after his, he was dead. His liver, and his... his spleen, his, really? his, his stomach, and so on. Those were mummified and placed alone. And this woman, this Selket, the goddess, who was a protectress, is one of the most beautiful images that uh, has ever been created. Forgive me, but it looks like Elizabeth Taylor. I would think even Elizabeth Taylor, <laughs> beautiful as she is, would love <laughs> to know that she was associated with this young creature, Selkett. Well, finally, after literally 10 years of going through the four chambers, 5,000 works of art, Carter realized that he had found no documents, no histories, nothing written about who this young boy was. Well, here he is on his mask. He came to the throne when he was nine. He married when he was 11. And he died probably when he was around 18 or 19, or possibly a little bit later. But the glory of this young man is not only his beauty, his gold, but the absolute mystery of really who he was in time. But one thing is not a mystery at all. He was seeking the afterlife, and he achieved it. He did indeed. And he's achieving it all over the United States, because a million, 300,000 people on the average are visiting every museum where this thing is being shown. There are so many questions to ask you, and we only have a limited amount of time, and forgive me for the ones I don't ask, but what to you is the most important value of this find more than 50 years ago, still for us today? I think the value is that we have an absolute record 
of a king of ancient times, how he was buried, everything he took with him, and all of the religious connotations of that time just there for us. The curse. We've seen so many bad movies about the curse of the Egyptian mummy. There was also a good one, because yeah. Boris Karloff really got his start <laughs> That's right. in one of them, and he was fantastic. Yes, right? he was. <laughs> Any truth to that? I mean, well, not that there was a curse, but there was the legend of the curse, right? Lord Canaveron dies about five months after the discovery. Now, this was the now, man Lord who Canaveran paid for Lord Canaveron is the backer, right. the man who put up the cash for Howard Carter, an earl, archaeologist, amateur. He died, and everybody said, ah, the curse. He must have pricked his finger on something that had ancient poison or something like that. The fact is that Lord Canaveron was dying long before the tomb was discovered. He'd had a terrifying automobile accident several years before, and he was really deteriorating. So it had really nothing to do with that. Then the newspapers in the 20s, anytime anybody died that had any indirect, wildly indirect connection with the tomb, curse strikes again, you know? But when you really analyze the list, as I have done, you find that uh, a lot of them never were in Egypt in their lives. Hmm. One of the more fascinating ones that the newspapers ascribed to the curse of the pharaoh was a fellow who had been in the vicinity, who two years later was shot by his mistress <laughs> in a hotel room in London, which is kind of stretching it, you know? That's right. <laughs> so, <Say to> leave. <laughs> I don't personally believe in the, in the pharaoh's curse. The mummification of King Tut, tell us about that. It, was a practice, of course, at that time. And tell us about the 70-day period I heard you speak of. Well, there was a, uh, really a ritual and almost legal guideline that the remains had to be mummified within 70 days, mummified and placed within the tomb within 70 days of the death. And what they did was to take the vital organs out through the body, through the nose with a special instrument. And they, those were mummified and placed in those that other shrine, which one just saw. Then the body was dried out, stuffed with natron, which is a dehydration material, then wrapped and wrapped and wrapped in layer after layer of the finest linen. And in each layer, they would throw in resins and oils and perfumes and unguents and throw all that jewelry in there mm -hmm. and keep wrapping and wrapping. Now, in the case of Tutankhamun, they were so lavish in the use of these preservatives that they turned against it and caused extraordinary decay. If they just left him alone, wrapped him in linen and put him in there, he would be in very good shape. Hmm. So in this case, it was a bad job and it didn't work out so well. So his mummy is in pretty bad shape. Although you can still see his facial features and you can see uh, the skeleton and so on. Do we know why he died at such a young age? No idea. Hmm. Unable to tell but at There's all. been every theory that you can possibly imagine. It looked at one point like his head had an injury, but now that was disproved, and then they thought it was tuberculosis, and then somebody said, how you, can, you know, can't really find that out, and then they thought he was poisoned. There's no trace of poison. Tom Hoving, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, King Tut, I, I will say no more except to let you look upon his golden visage once more, as we say. We'll be right back. <laughs>